It's a pleasure today for me to be able to introduce uh, one of our own faculty members as our speaker today. Uh, Tom Weshey is currently uh, an associate professor jointly appointed uh, between the Water Research Center and the Department of Range Management in the uh, College of Agriculture. Tom holds a BS degree from the University of Wyoming in Fisheries Management and also a master's degree from here in Water Resources, uh, which he obtained in 1973, and he's uh, currently uh, well along toward finishing his doctoral degree uh, in uh, engineering science from Washington State University uh, next year. He's uh, <clears throat> certified by both the American Fisheries Society as a fishery scientist and by the uh, American Institute of Hydrology as a professional uh, hydrologist. His research program since getting his master's here in 1973 has focused on habitat requirements for salmonid fishes, uh, methodologies for determination of in-stream flow regimes below water development projects, restoration of degraded aquatic habitats, and also the hydrology of riparian areas. Uh, Tom's topic today is the response of mountain stream channels to flow depletion, project results, and flushing flow requirements. Tom, welcome to Water Talk. Thank you, Steve. It's certainly a pleasure to be here today to spend a few minutes anyway visiting with you about a couple of what I feel anyway are the more interesting projects that I've worked on uh, in the time that I've been uh, here at the University of Wyoming. A couple of projects which not only combine uh, fish habitat uh, research, but also the uh, interdisciplinary nature of stream channels, the hydrology, the sediment transport, the hydraulic processes of stream channels, and how these can function to uh, hopefully maintain uh, fish habitat in our cold water stream systems. So that introduction, I think, will go straight to the slides. Got a lot of slides, so we'll keep moving right along here. If you have any questions as we go, I assume the policy, Steve, is to chime right in as, as we proceed. Uh, the first of the two papers I'd like to talk about is the adjustment of mountain stream channels uh, to flow regime alteration. This is some work which uh, Quentin Skinner uh, from Range Management, Steve Wolf, and myself completed, oh, about a year ago. Uh, the final report is still in draft phase, funded by the Wyoming Water Development Commission and also with partial support provided by the Water Research uh, Center. Now, to get right to our objective uh, in this work, what we were attempting to do in this study was to quantify uh, the physical response of mountain stream channels to stream flow depletion. And our purpose in doing this and we'll spend a few minutes talking about these channel maintenance flows, was basically to provide the Water Development Commission in the, uh, with insight regarding the need for channel maintenance flow or flushing flow uh, releases uh, below mountain water diversion projects. You may be familiar with water development here in Wyoming in the West. A very commonly used uh, technique for this is called transbasin diversion, where diversion structures such as the city of Denver has, such as the city of Cheyenne has, located on the west slope. They divert water into a pipeline system, tunnel it through the Continental Divide into the eastern uh, slope, primarily for municipal uh, use. And historically, uh, this type of use has been ongoing here uh, in Wyoming. And the Water Development Commission was uh, doing some planning studies looking at uh, what they call the, fi the proposed Fish Creek diversion uh, system. If you're familiar with where the City of Cheyenne's Stage 2 project is, we'll look at a map later on. Uh, the Fish Creek proposed project, also part of Stage 3, also known as, is located just north of the Little Snake River drainage down around the uh, Wyoming-Colorado border. But the idea was to bring water from the west slope over to the east slope. In doing this, and in, in developing their uh, proposed plan of development, the U.S. Forest Service, uh, as the land management agency involved, raised the question of channel maintenance flows. And the Forest Service made some, uh, at least preliminary in the planning process, estimates of what would be required for 
uh, channel maintenance purposes, to maintain the size and the shape of that stream channel. And also then indirectly to help to maintain the quantity and the quality of the fish habitat in that stream system. Well, as, well as one thing led to another, uh, the uh, Water Development Commission approached uh, the Water Center with the idea of doing some research in this area into the need of these channel maintenance flows in our high mountain uh, stream system. So uh, the talk I'm presenting today is then a re uh, result uh, of that research uh, work which came out of these discussions primarily between the Water Development Commission and the U.S. Forest Service. The basic uh, relationships that we're dealing with when we're talking about a stream channel uh, response to uh, water development is very clearly shown here in uh, Lane's uh, water and sediment balance for an alluvial stream system. Uh, if you look at the beam balance shown there, a bucket of water on one side, a, a pile of sediment on the other, in a stable uh, stream channel, a stream system, there is a relative balance between the water, the discharge in that system, and the sediment which is transported down through that system. As you can see on the bottom of the uh, diagram here, the sediment load, the product of the sediment load times the size of that sediment is proportional to the slope of the channel and the discharge through that channel, i.e. the stream power which is available uh, for sediment transport. So if we upset the balance uh, shown here on our beam balance by for example, removing water, the uh, logic becomes that if the sediment loadings remain the same, we will not have enough stream power remaining in the channel to uh, kick that sediment down through the system. And the result, we would swing our pendulum toward the uh, grading or the channel filling uh, end of our rating scale there. Show you just a couple examples here. Uh, this is what we call, would call an grading type of stream channel. Those of you in our river restoration uh, class, this is probably your third time for some of you through some of these uh, slides today, this week. So bear with me. We'll get on to some new ones here in a few minutes. But anyway, uh, this is a stream in northern Colorado located near a major ski area. There's been quite a lot of road development in that area, quite a lot of uh, major highway from Denver uh, is located in that uh, watershed and what we've seen as a result of uh, sanding and graveling operations uh, we feel in that watershed a lot of this new material has gotten into the stream system and there's not enough stream power there to kick it on through the system so we have an aggrading channel. Another type of example going back to Lane's sediment water balance is this example of a small tributary here in southeast uh, Wyoming over in the Brush Creek. Uh, drainage, small tributary channel, which years and years ago, uh, a rancher in the area decided rather than build a uh, diversion canal to, to convey water uh, from his diversion structure down to where he wanted to use that water for irrigation purposes, he ran it into a small stream channel. Uh, above this particular location, before this uh, flow augmentation occurs, the channel is about oh, four to five feet wide and maybe a foot or two deep. Uh, you can see here the degradation which has occurred through ups the upsetting of that water and sediment balance in this particular small stream system. This uh, head cutting here has left this channel about 75 feet deep, about 75 feet wide. Certainly the, uh, you can make a visual estimate anyway of the amount of sediment which has come out of this uh, small creek and has been deposited somewhere uh, in the system. From the aspect of channel stability, then we look at a bedrock channel uh, such as this and in, under conditions, channel conditions such as this, uh, we could add uh, immeasurable amounts of water to this particular channel in the foreground here really without, at least in our lifetime, having much of an impact uh, on that channel. Uh, likewise, we could add quite a lot of sediment to that given that steep grade we would more than likely keep kicking it right down through that system. So uh, certainly a very stable situation here and one which isn't going to easily respond or change to either 
uh, a change in the water budget or the sediment budget. So in looking at channel response uh, of stream flow depletion water development, uh, this certainly wasn't a new topic. Uh, other work has been done uh, throughout the country, throughout North America. Uh, this particular slide uh, shows some work which was done by the USGS back in the late 70s over on the North Platte River system. If you look, the time scale on the x-axis here runs from 1860 to 1990. And along the y-axis, along the top, we have average annual peak flow, mean annual flow, and then the lower plot C there is the width of the Platte River Channel. And what this uh, figure is showing us is the response of the Platte River Channel to long-term water development. You can see the change uh, in the water balance in the top two uh, slides, the corresponding change in channel width on a low gradient alluvial system uh, such as the North Platte River in Nebraska. And what we were looking at was the response of mountain stream channels, very steep, steep, rough, tributary types of channels to water development. So quickly to run through our study design here, our study area really was the whole state of Wyoming. Also, we ventured down into northern Colorado in trying to build our sample size in trying to locate uh, diversion structures on mountain stream systems where water diversion was really the, one of the only uh, perturbations on that system. And that's rather tough uh, given the extensive road development, ski area development, all the typical types of mountain development, the uh, dredging for gold mining and copper mining activities, things like that, which have had an impact on our stream system. So uh, a great deal of our study time was spent really just trying to isolate and locate uh, these streams where there was a single diversion structure taking out a, a given quantity of water where we could put together uh, at least some description of the flow history of it and also where we didn't have these outside perturbations which would influence uh, channel dimensions. So anyway, the control variables uh, for our study were basically the channel uh, characteristics uh, the width, the depth uh, of the channel, the gradient of the channel was a primary characteristic uh, that we took into consideration in looking and trying to stratify our sample of study streams. Gradient was an overriding consideration in that area. Also the amount of hydrograph uh, modification which had taken place, the length of that uh, hydrograph modification of that water development. We've already talked about watershed perturbations. Now the response variables we were looking at were very simply the, the width of the stream channels, the depth of those channels, and then what's called the conveyance capacity of those channels, which is an estimate of the amount of discharge which the channel could carry at a bank full uh, condition. So width, depth, and conveyance capacity were the three response variables that we went out uh, and measured. Uh, talk briefly about our study reach characteristics. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we primarily stratified by gradient, you know, steep, moderate, and low gradient. Those of you familiar with Rosgen's channel classification system, you can imply here A's, B's, and C's. Look at the characteristics of our steep gradient reaches following the Rosgen uh, classification system. Slopes here were greater than 4%, so quite a steep uh, channel. Uh, the number of uh, pairs which we were able to locate and measure, we're only able to find seven. Uh, you'll notice our sample sizes are really quite small uh, in total given the problems we've already discussed in trying to uh, find these rascals. But anyway, uh, we had seven pairs and by a pair I refer to an upstream reach with a downstream diversion structure and then a reach somewhere immediately below the diversion structure before we have major tributary inflow coming into it. So that's what we mean by a pair. Mean elevation, the average age of diversion, about 35 years, and the average flow depletion, about 70%. So these were relatively new diversions uh, compared to some of the others we'll see 
uh, but the amount of flow being taken out was well over half of the total amount of flow. Our moderate gradient, again following Rosgen, slopes of 1.5 to 4 percent, sample size of 7, average age again about 35 years, uh, and about 70 percent of the flow being removed. We move on down the mountain further till we get into our C types of channels, our low gradient less than 1.5 percent. We were able to locate six pairs here, and average age about 66 years, and about, 50, about half of the water being removed. Typical diversion structure here, this is one the city of Denver uh, installed back in the early 50s, if I remember correctly. They're in northern Colorado on the west slope. But this is a typical looking diversion structure that we were uh, involved with uh, in this particular study. Now above that uh, diversion structure, what we'll go through now is just a series of shots comparing upstream and downstream through our various gradient classes and give you a feel for some of the results uh, that we saw. We'll start with the steep gradient or the A types of channels high in the headwaters. Uh, they're high and located high in the forest snowpack zone. Accretion flows uh, were quite significant from snow melt coming into the channels uh, below those diversion structures. So anyway, this is an A type of a channel, steep gradient in this case, so on the order of five, six percent. As you can see, uh, the substrate is uh, quite large. The channel has quite a low width to depth uh, ratio. But anyway, take a look at that channel. And here's the same channel down below the diversion structure, uh, obviously minus the water, so from a fish habitat standpoint, uh, I don't think I'd want to be the fish trying to live there. But from a channel morphology standpoint, in, since about 1950 in this particular case, the channel still remains, has maintained its uh, dimensions of width, depth, and conveyance capacity uh, in this particular situation. Take a look at our B or our moderate gradient types of channels. This is uh, South Brush Creek, if I remember correctly. You can see a diversion structure there in the background. Brush, South Brush is flowing down into. That, <clears throat> excuse me, that particular structure has territorial water rights uh, on it, which date back to pre-1890. Uh, so this is a very historic uh, diversion site here uh, in the Brush Creek watershed. But anyway, above the diversion, our study reach was located somewhat upstream from here. We measure a channel on the order of 25 to 30 feet in width. Uh, below that diversion structure, on a similar grade, we measure a channel of very similar dimensions. In that time uh, which had passed since water de development, water diversion began on this B type of channel here, we really saw a little shrinkage uh, in that stream channel. Uh, one more example of a B type of a channel. Uh, this is the North Fork of the Encampment River over by the town of Encampment. Uh, it's in the uh, steep foothills of the Encampment River system. Oh, about, oh, be about five, six miles above the town of Encampment near the forest boundary. There again, we're looking at a B type of channel. You can see a diversion canal here in the foreground. Right here, this is the Walford Canal, which has been in operation for, I don't remember the exact date, but a good long time anyway. Uh, in that North Fork system. But above the Walford, uh, this is what our B type of channel uh, looks like. Again, a channel on the order of 25 to 30 feet on the North Fork of the Encampment River. And below that uh, diversion outtake, our channel is pretty much on this gradient, this moderate gradient, has pretty much maintained its own dimensions. Again, 25 to 30 feet in width, depth, conveyance capacity have remained virtually the same. Uh, one other example of a mountain stream system, this is the North Fork of the Little Snake River, which was developed by the city of Cheyenne back in 1964 when their stage one water development plan uh, was finally completed. Shows a diversion structure there on the North Fork of the Little Snake River. Above the uh, Little Snake diversion structure, we measure a channel 10 to 12 feet in width, moderate gradient again, about 2 percent down through this particular reach a stream. We go below the diversion structure where 
until stage two became a reality and in-stream flows were released, there really was no in-stream flow uh, below the stage one diversion structures. So as part of stage two, the Forest Service was successful uh, in getting in-stream flow, minimum in-stream flow releases below these uh, structures. But basically, this channel had been virtually dry for uh, a number of years except for periodic spills or construction type failures plus accretion flows from snowmelt runoff coming in between the diversion and this particular uh, reach of stream. But again, channel width, depth, conveyance capacity, about the same here as what we measured uh, above the uh, North Fork diversion structure. But you follow down on the North Fork of the Little Snake River and you hit these lower gradient reaches, these C types of channels as Dave Rosgen uh, calls them, in this particular case a grade of less than 1%. And it's in these areas where you begin to see the encroachment process uh, begin to uh, take place. Here we have a channel which is neck down to five, six feet. And if you take a close look here, really you can see the encroachment uh, process take place. If you look, see this bright shiny uh, material, these fine sediments which are in the system. There's been road development, diversion, uh, construction related uh, development upslope from where this particular uh, shot was taken and eventually this material has migrated down into the channels and without uh, adequate flow regime going back to that sediment water balance to kick that deposited material on out, sedges, other riparian vegetation in the system has a chance, even though we're at very high altitude, very short growing season, that over the space of the 30 years, 25 years, uh, it begins to move in and encroach on that uh, stream channel. Uh, one other example of a C type of channel, this is the New Fork River. Vic, I imagine you've seen this one a time or two. But the New Fork is an interesting system up around Pinedale. Uh, the New Fork is heavily used for uh, irrigation water, uh, growing uh, native grass hay uh, down through the New Fork Valley. Once the New Fork comes out of New Fork Lakes and comes down the mountain and into the uh, irrigated uh, hay meadows there. But anyway, this is what the New Fork looks like just coming out of the mountains. We measure a channel there uh, on the order of 45 to 50 feet in width. We move downstream, what, it, what would it be, Vic, maybe 10 river miles down to Leopold's cabin? Yeah. Something on those, that order. But anyway, all the way down through that 10 miles from the previous shot to this one, irrigation water is being removed uh, in quite considerable quantities from the New Fork uh, system. By the time we move down about 10 miles, in response to that flow depletion, we measure a channel that runs between 15 and 20 feet in width. Look at it, look at some of the data. Here the, I guess I don't have much control, I hope that's in focus enough so at least you can see the white line and the yellow line. There we go, thank you. Uh, along the uh, y-axis on this side in the white letters, we have mean channel width and in the yellow or gold letters, we have mean daily summer stream flow. And along the uh, x-axis there is river distance moving from on this side. This is near uh, in the foothills, com just coming out of the mountains, down to the lower end of the irrigated uh, hay meadows where we start to see some return flow. But in that, on the New Fork, is, it's a beautiful example of river response to uh, stream flow depletion on this relatively low gradient C type of a stream channel. In fact, the white line, the flow, uh, virtually parallels the changes in channel uh, dimension here in the New Fork system. So certainly a good example of channel response in a lower gradient type of a system. Okay, so let's take just a quick look then uh, to wind up this part of the talk on channel response at some summary slides of, okay, overall, given our total of 20 pairs of streams that we looked at, uh, how did they change in response to uh, water diversion 
on the steep, on the moderate, on the low gradient uh, stream sections. The red bars here are measurements, summary of measurements taken above diversions. The white bars are below diversions. If we look at this particular one here is for measuring channel width. Take a look at the steep gradient uh, bars there on the left side. We see very little change above and below on these steep gradient greater than 4% uh, slopes through our seven pairs of study sites. Same results were seen in the moderate gradient. This is still, these are the B types of channels, really our bread and butter fish habitat channels uh, up on the Medicine Bow uh, National Forest, for example. But anyway, very little change in those moderate gradients. And then when we move down to the low gradient, this is where we begin to see some statistical differences above and below in terms of our channel dimensions. If we look at channel depth, we basically see the same, same trend. Little change on the steep and the moderate, but when we get to the lower gradient sections, this is where we begin to see uh, channel encroachment and channel filling taking over. And if we combine width, depth, and slope, cross-sectional area, to an estimate of conveyance capacity, uh, we see an even uh, greater difference on those low gradient uh, channels. Okay, now from a channel maintenance standpoint, what that, uh, in analyzing these data, taking a look at it, what it tells us is that from the standpoint of channel maintenance, on these A and B types of channels, if we're out to maintain channel dimensions, and by that through the influence of the flow regime on uh, sediment transport processes through that channel, uh, I would suggest that what this is telling us is that for A and B channels, the channel maintenance flow question may not be uh, an extremely critical question. High in the forest snowpack zone, sediment loadings are quite low. We get accretion of snowmelt coming rapidly into the channels so that uh, excessive, in my mind anyway, channel maintenance recommendations for these types of channels uh, may be just that, excessive and a bit of overkill. When we get down in the system uh, onto the uh, plains, then we have to take a closer look at those stream channels there and from a management perspective assess what the condition of the habitats are and what in the long term may, I speak of long term and say the 50 year uh, lifespan of a water, typical water development project, but anyway assess what, these, what the condition of that habitat is and uh, what uh, the managers whoever the management agency may be, whether it be the Forest Service or BLM or Game and Fish or whoever, or the private landowner should also have some say in this, what does he want that channel uh, to look like? And by flow removal, we can have an influence on what uh, the characteristics of that channel are. So the channel maintenance question, from what we can see anyway on these steep and moderate gradient slopes, is not as critical is what it is downstream and if we're diverting water high in the basin we have to take a look at that diversion up there in regards to its overall impact much much further down in the system where we hit those low gradient types of channels. So anyway a companion study uh, to the channel response uh, work which we had going on is what I call the Big Sandstone uh, Crick Project Big Sandstone Creek is located in south central uh, Wyoming. Big Sandstone was uh, being considered, being proposed for water development under the Fish Creek uh, development project. So it was one of those streams basically that there was some uh, conflict between the Water Development Commission and the Forest Service over what was needed to maintain uh, channel dimensions down through that channel in light of this high mountain uh, diversion system which the Water Development Commission was proposing. We had a slide that didn't drop there. There it comes. The Big Sandstone Creek drainage is high on the west slope of the 
Continental Divide over in the Sierra Madre uh, portion of the Medicine Bow National Forest. It shows an overview of the watershed. Historic uses here, uh, there was some mining activity, a little bit of four-wheel drive road development. But other than that, I'm not aware of a whole lot else that has taken place here uh, in the upper uh, Big Sandstone Creek watershed. Uh, what the stream channels uh, look like, uh, more typical uh, moderate to steep gradient mountain stream channels, gradients generally range between four and about down to two uh, percent. Uh, from a fish habitat standpoint, historically the Big Sandstone Creek as well as most of those West Slope streams were uh, native habitat for the Colorado River cutthroat. However, at the present time, Big Sandstone Creek itself is predominantly brook dominated by brook trout. Uh, this map shows the upper Big Sandstone Creek uh, watersheds, the small triangles located here, here, and here denote where our three study areas uh, were located. Uh, we had three study reaches, one located on the north fork of Big Sandstone and one located on the south fork of Big Sandstone. These two were located at proposed uh, diversion points as near as we could locate them uh, in the field. We added then a third uh, study site down below the confluence uh, of the two to take a closer look at uh, potential impacts or what's going on down below uh, the proposed diversion site. So we had three study sites, the North Fork, the South Fork, and then Big Sandstone Creek proper. Our three study sites were selected based upon uh, to a large extent, channel characteristics, the representative uh, nature of channel characteristics, and an extension of that, the habitat characteristics. This shows, I believe, our North Fork uh, study area. Each study area consisted of a short reach of stream which incorporated at least one riffle pool uh, sequence. And moving our study area begins up above the fellow in the yellow coat. Chris, is that you up there? So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and anyway, continues on down uh, to below this fellow in the blue coat, blue jacket here, and each consisted of either four to five cross-channel uh, transects. I had each of these uh, at the North Fork, the South Fork study sites. We had recording stream flow gauges, device with the blue uh, PVC pipe over there as a stilling well gauge with an F1 stage recorder on it, and our cross-sections were used for developing hydraulic geometry relationships, channel morphology relationships, and were also our basic sampling unit for bed load and suspended load uh, sampling through, down through each of our study reaches. Our reaches were selected so that we had a high gradient riffle, i.e. a high energy, high transport uh, cross section at the upper end, and on the lower end we had a lower gradient more or less call it a pool uh, cross-section so that we had this habitat unit of riffle and pool and we could look at sediment import and sediment export down through uh, these three study stream reaches in response to the flow regime. Uh, it shows old Steve Wolf taking a uh, bed load sample there at one of our uh, cross-sections. I should uh, mention, I know, see Chris is here, Steve has gone on to bigger and better things with a consulting firm on the West Coast. And Larry Dolan has uh, gone on to work for the state of Montana. But basically these three guys uh, lived for how many years? Four years, Chris? Between Big Sandstone and the North Fork of the Little Snake. Every April they would move up uh, to near the Continental Divide and they would basically live there through about the first of July. So I've never seen a field effort like we at the water center got from these guys uh, during some of this flushing and channel maintenance flow work. So anyway, point that out and give these guys some a big part of the credit uh, for us being able to do this type of a study. You're looking at totally roadless conditions. Travel was via snowmobile sometimes for as much as 25, 30 miles uh, to get in to get the sampling done here. 
And also we were interested uh, throughout our study reaches and also over the two year length of the study, what is happening to the bed composition uh, of these study reaches. Is it changing or are we dealing with a fairly stable type of a uh, stream system? So anyway, just to take a quick look in concluding here at some of the uh, data and some of the results which we found from this uh, fairly detailed look at sediment transport processes through an undeveloped mountain stream channel. Uh, this first slide shows the hydrograph uh, on the North Fork uh, study site for 1987 spring runoff and then the 1988 uh, spring runoff. 87 was an early, very low water year. 1988 was very close to really a very normal uh, water year. Our peak flows during 88 uh, got up to the bank full, uh, into the bank full range of flows. So we we're able to sample not only low flows, but all the way up through the bank full uh, condition. If we take a look at our hydraulic geometry relationships, which we were able to develop based upon a series of uh, cross-section measurements from high, from low to high flows. Uh, this particular plot shows the relationship between QW or discharge at our three study sites versus stream power, which is often considered a measure of the sediment transport capability uh, at a cross-section. We actually, we actually have six cross-sections plotted here and our focus of our analysis, as I mentioned before, was on the upstream high energy cross section, what's coming in, what's going out at that lower energy uh, downstream cross section in each reach. Apologize for the small lettering on some of these, but the general trend of the data here as we had envisioned it would be in selecting our cross sections was that here for the North Fork, the upper cross section had a higher unit stream power than what the lower cross section did. This trend holds true for all three of our study reaches. Higher energy, lower energy coming out, lower transport capacity. Uh, for each of our uh, cross sections, uh, sediment transport relationships were developed. This is a summary slide here, plotting once again water discharge and on the y-axis sediment transport of material less than about two millimeters uh, in diameter. We focused in on, we did a size breakdown of all of our bed load samples, but for the final analysis I focused in on this size fraction of less than two millimeters uh, for two reasons really. When we're talking spawning habitat, it's generally this fraction, the coarse sands on down, which we're concerned with as far as having an impact on egg survival down in the gravels. Wayne uh, currently has a project ongoing and I'm working with him on that to some extent looking at uh, the rates of egg mortality in response to various sediment loadings, fine sediment loadings down in the gravels. The second reason was our thinking was that it's this fine material in the system which the uh, riparian vegetation uses to take root in and to begin to encroach uh, the channel. So those two reasons, spawning conditions and vegetation encroachment. But just to look at the, point out one trend uh, which shows up in all cases here, if we can, is there a pointer? There's one. Just focus on these two lines right here in the middle. The upper one here is Transec 5, the upper cross section going into our Big Sandstone study reach. Uh, Transec 1 at Big Sandstone was our lower, low energy cross section. So if you follow these two lines uh, down the chart, you'll see a crossover right in this particular area. And this crossover holds for all three of our uh, study sites. We see a crossover uh, in those and that's telling us that at our very high flows, sediment transport at our high energy cross sections is relatively greater than it is at our low energy cross sections, which can be, uh, we can look at that as what's happening is we're scouring in those steep gradient riffles at the very high flows and we're dumping it in the pools, okay? 
during the low flows, transport at the low gradient pools is exceeding transport in our higher gradient, higher energy uh, riffle sections. What, what I feel we're looking at there is a function of sediment availability. We've scoured out during the high flows the sediment out of those cross sections, so there's very little else that those lower flows, those mid-range flows, has to move. But at our, in our pool cross sections, we have that fine stored material, and even at, down at our lower flows, that material is being kicked out of our system to, rem to maintain a relative balance. I took a little closer look at that, and this plot will just take a look at the big sandstone uh, study area over here, and it's a plot of percent of cross-section width which exceeds a critical velocity for sediment transport for a given particle size. Again, the particle size I used was this two millimeter diameter, which is coarse sand, the breakpoint right between fine gravel and coarse sand. If you take a look over here at big sandstone, transect one here, our lowermost transect, transect five, our uppermost, our riffle cross section here. Up here we have plotted a high flow for each of those cross sections at about oh, 65 to 70 CFS. And what this tells us is that at the high flow, which is uh, not quite a bank full condition for these particular cross sections, that at least 60% of our width in the pool and approaching 80 to 90% of the width of our cross section in the riffle is, has a bottom velocity exceeding the critical transport velocity for this coarse sand at the high flow. So we're moving a lot of material at both of these cross sections. But then, if you remember that crossover at the lower and mid-range flows, this may help to explain what's happening there. If you take a look at a 4 CFS flow, which is uh, down near an in-stream flow, base flow condition here, we see that about 30% of our cross section at this base flow condition in the pool still is exceeding that critical transport velocity. Whereas over here in our riffle, probably likely due to excessive roughness, a very coarse substrate in these areas, we had very little, very few or no bottom velocities across our cross section which exceeded that critical uh, velocity. So to some extent this helps to explain why we are continuing to transport these sands out of the pools uh, during uh, the low flow condition. And this is what helps to maintain the sediment balance in that system. Uh, for the sake of moving along, we'll keep going here. Uh, to take a look then at the overall big sandstone creek uh, system, uh, through our study reach, I should say, not the entire system, we used what the Forest Service calls a dimensionless uh, duration, flow duration curve, which they have developed for the Medicine Bow uh, National Forest. We, a flow duration curve uh, basically defines the percent of time a given flow level is equal or exceeded in a stream system. If you have some estimate of how much time a given flow expressed as a percent of the mean daily or the average discharge for that stream is available, how often uh, it occurs, and you know what the sediment transport rate is, uh, the, relation, the basic relationship between sediment transport and discharge in your channel, then you can begin to put together a sediment budget through a stream reach. If you have the sediment relationship going in, sediment relationship going out, you can take a normal average type flow regime here and over a normal average type water year, you can look at what's going to happen uh, to that uh, stream channel. So we did that. And uh, for undeveloped, uh, the undeveloped condition, we found that in effect what we had was a very balanced uh, system. For, I can't remember the exact numbers, but what we were importing over the entire water year was very similar to what we were exporting. 
out of our study reach. We had a pretty fine balance there at each of our three uh, study stations. If we take a look at the size composition of our bed material, uh, this one is for the uh, big sandstone creek study reach. We have a plot of particle size here going from 100 millimeters on down to fractions of a millimeter plotted against percent finer than by weight here. But our D50 of our bed material remained extremely constant throughout the two years of the study. So from this and also looking at the percent sand, in this column here, percent sand ranged from about 13 to 16 percent. Very little variation uh, during those two years. So it would indicate to us that we were in a fairly stable uh, type of situation uh, there in the Big Sandstone Creek Basin, regardless of whether we had the 87 low water year or the 88 normal water year. Our next step then, our final step, was to the Water Development Commission, of course, was interested in what's going to happen if we develop water. Well, we developed a hydrograph for that condition for the Big Sandstone Creek uh, study site. This particular plot shows the 1987 uh, simulated hydrograph with development. What it would look like, this is located down below the North Fork and the South Fork diversion structures, with the only release from those structures being the required minimum stream flows, uh, which Wyoming Game and Fish had proposed for those stream sections. So what we had was the North Fork minimum, the South Fork minimum, and then whatever accretion flows uh, between the diversion structures and our big sandstone study site, whatever snowmelt runoff was coming in. So during our low water year of 1987, this is what that hydrograph looked like. We were peaking for a daily average around only 12 uh, cubic feet per second here, and once again peaking in mid-May or thereabouts. But the important thing is that once we had the hydrograph, then we could apply our sediment transport relationships to that and at least make an estimate of what we're importing and exporting into those reaches of stream. And while there may look like quite a, quite a difference there uh, figuratively on the, on the graph, we're talking about only about a two ton of material difference in uh, import and export, which is not very many cubic feet of material, really. So what it's telling us is that, according to this analysis anyway, we're actually exporting a bit more material from our pools than what we're importing into it from our riffles under this particular water development uh, scenario. So uh, we might expect a slight coarsening of the bed material. We looked at 1988 again on big sandstone, same exact type of plot. This is our synthesized hydrograph right here. Peak flows during a much better water year up around 40 uh, cubic feet per second in that particular range. And we see the same trend through the May-June runoff period. We are uh, exporting slightly more material than what we're importing uh, into the stream reach. We're kicking out more through our pool than what our riffle is able to uh, provide. So anyway, uh, we're looking at a difference there of about three tons uh, of material. These are very low uh, sediment producing watersheds. Keep that in mind when we're talking. I'm sure Dick has got his horror stories too of the muddy cricks of the world and uh, things like that that move literally hundreds of thousands of tons of material a day. So we're talking very low sediment producing uh, streams here. But anyway, what we found in the Big Sandstone Creek uh, example really, in my mind, helped to reinforce what we were seeing through our channel response work, that on these A and B types of channels, they are in balance. They have generally a surplus of energy available for transport for the most part and very little material to transport. So we can develop some water and from the standpoint of maintaining the channel and the habitat, that if we don't have massive 
uh, erosion failures like we've seen in stage two uh, with one sediment spill after another. If we're not importing a lot of new material into the system, we do a good job on erosion control in these A and B types of channels that we don't need these quite high channel maintenance flow releases uh, below the diversion structures to maintain those channels up in the forest. Now, as I pointed out earlier, we do need to take a closer look down lower at those systems. It may be on forest land, it may be off forest land. Then it becomes a little bit different uh, bureaucratic type of a situation. But for A and B channels on the forest, uh, from what we've seen anyway, it doesn't look like we see, uh, we didn't find a lot of evidence indicating that massive encroachment of the channel was going to occur uh, given a typical water development uh, scenario. So, I'd be happy to respond to any questions that anyone might have. Questions for Tom, please. Yeah, Dick. Tom, going back to your uh, flow duration diagram and how you would link that up with a uh, sediment transport curve, did you um, look at uh, what the frequency of the flow would be that accounts for the greatest amount of sediment transport? Yeah, we did. We I calculated out effective discharges. Uh, the effective discharge being the one which really does the most work in the channel based upon not only its availability, but also its transport rate. Okay. And for all three of these reaches, that effective discharge was right around eight to ten times the average discharge. So it was just slightly below a bank full uh, condition. So it followed a lot of the literature, I guess, in that in that respect. You know what the frequency of that flow? Would that be a two-year event, five-year event? Uh, it would probably be about a 1.5. So. Yes. Early in your slides, you showed above and below old diversions, and you looked at channel width and depth and conveyance, mm -hmm. and you focused primarily on the C-type channels, but I noticed in the A and the B channels, your conveyance actually increased below your diversion, as well as, and your width and your depth did as well, mm -hmm. but it was most easily seen on that conveyance slide. Right. Would you attribute that to the latter part of your talk where you're saying that lower flows actually you get higher sediment export than import or do well, you have not, an explanation uh, for that? Well, necessarily seeing an increase in conveyance. We're seeing a decrease. Well, excuse me, let me start over here. Conveyance is the product of the width, the depth, and then slope also comes into uh, play on that, into that calculation, plus an estimate of the channel roughness. So it's a, uh, you're dealing with a product of several of the other variables, so that helps to expand that difference between upstream and downstream uh, below the diversion uh, structures. So that, I feel, probably accounts for uh, the difference above and below uh, the product of the other changes in channel dimensions. That's why it makes that conveyance change looks so large uh, in comparison. But definitely on the sea channels, there was channel shrinkage uh, going on. Those channels were, it was very visible just standing there without even measuring it, just taking a picture of it. And, uh, very easy to see that that channel had filled uh, and it also narrowed in many cases. So, yes? Um, I'm not familiar with this um, big sandstone project what's the status on that are they going ahead with development or they're not at the present time Vic you could probably give us the status of that well thank you very much <laughs>